So to, by, by, the end of, by the end of this session, we will learn, uh, we will uh, review and learn what polymorph is, uh, what, uh, what inheritance is, <coughs> what uh, does it mean when uh, a method overrides a method of a base class. We will understand uh, what does it mean uh, to have a virtual function. How does virtuality affect and helps polymorphism and implements polymorphism? And, and at the end, we'll understand what is an abstract base class and what is an interface. We're going to go through examples all the way through. And hopefully, when we are going out, we're not going to have any questions about it. All right? So we know what the plan is for today, right? We're OK? All right. So <clears throat> I'm not going to go through the animal thing because that was a simple thing and we all know. I'm going to start from cat and go back again, OK? So one of the key points in, in teaching concept of, of this is circling, is to keep going back to what we, you were teaching and repeat it and then repeat it and then repeat it, OK? That's why I keep going back because this is something that you need to really understand. Um, and the concept that you are learning now, it's not only C++. Any object-oriented language that you work with, in a way, in its own way, implemented this object-oriented feature. And it helps you do amazing stuff. So be aware. So uh, we know that we don't have any questions from last thing. We're going to start with the cat. So we said that. Uh, Set a startup project. We said that when we have an already existing class that holds something, that class for us is design. Designing something um, in our uh, following our business logic, designing something to uh, implement an object in our application. Those objects created. Uh, sometimes are completely satisfactory. They do exactly what you want. And sometimes, either over time or based on the design that you have, it's not complete. It needs to uh, be enhanced to do something more. Or by nature, they are something, they are part of something more. When that feeling arises, when you have an implementation and you see you have another thing that is essentially the same thing that you had before, but does more. That's when inheritance is involved. So inheritance is essentially taking an already existing design and create a new version of it without modifying the old one. OK? So in structured programming, we reused our code using what? Recalling functions, creating modules. We create modules. We put related functions inside the module. We create file scope variables that are only available to that module and not other modules. So we try to fake object orientation as much as, much as we could. We modularize everything, put the uh, functions in one file. We create file scope variables. We call it global in IPC 144, but we know they're not global. They are file scope variables, and they're only accept visible to the functions you have in that class. And therefore, uh, you try to encapsulate things into modules. And then you reuse your functions based on your modules, and you get organized like that. But the problem is that. A module in uh, an application uh, is essentially a bunch of functions sitting in a file. There is no uh, policing around what function can be called and what function cannot. What can be accessed and modified and what cannot. What cannot. The whole thing about object orient orientation is to police regulation on uh, your code so your brain doesn't have to. When we do object, why do we do object orientation? Because our brain is not organized enough. It's not um, equipped with getting organized to have such big scale problems solved and remember everything. So you make everything self-driven, 
so everything know what they are doing. And when you have a problem, you can focus on one problem and ignore everything else. Okay? What do we call this? When we look at one problem, abstraction. Okay? So abstraction is what we do. We just check to some and then, oh. Who said abstraction? You said abstraction. You want to get another person for the, <laughs> so 1% for the mid, for the final. <laughs> All right. So now we had the animal thing over there. We said, what is the syntax of creating something new out of something that is already, already there? We said that relationship, by the way, is called is a relationship. Uh, I asked the other class, now I don't need to ask you, I know you haven't taken any system analysis courses yet. Well, when you take it in an object-oriented uh, system analysis, you are essentially uh, ask the client to write a story, or what we call it a use case, of how the application is supposed to work. The client writes that in English for you. You read that and you identify what are the actors of the system. And you take the actors out and they become your classes. And then you, you get what the actors do, they become the methods. You see what actors do with each other and that becomes messages between classes. And after you design all these things based on the use case, because you followed the use case to build your actors, you say shoo and the system works. You don't need to think of what's happening first and what's happening next because you essentially had an English narration of what the system is supposed to do and you translate it into an object simulation of it in your program. Okay, so, um, so that's what's going on. Now, in that use case, <clears throat> whenever you see an is a relationship, you have inheritance or is an, or is a, in, in our case, because it's animal, it's, is an animal, right? So you're gonna have uh, an inheritance. So we're gonna say cat is an animal, therefore cat is inheritance. And the, the syntax for it was to create a class cat, put a column, not a scope resolution, and write public animal. And I said ignore that public, that pub, that, not that ignore it. Uh, that public could be protected and private, but that's too rich for our two, rich for our blood, we cannot do it, okay? So, so, so it's above our pay grade, that's something probably we're not gonna even touch in OP345. But, but uh, private and uh, uh, protected, first of all, if you see protected, just remember it, if you see protected inheritance, that means bad design. That shouldn't happen. It's like go-to in structured programming that we say you never use, but it's a bad thing to do. So protected is bad, private is a completely different thing, but just remember that we, we only thing we do is public, which means cat publicly inherits an animal. So the syntax of column public together between two classes means cat is an animal. As soon as an animal kicks in, it means everything that an animal has comes to cat and is accessible to cat directly or indirectly. That's, these two words are extremely important. When you inherit something from one class, you bring everything from the base class to the derived class, and all that the base class have is accessible to the derived class directly or indirectly. It is accessible directly if the base class provides those features and properties and methods and all the things protectedly or publicly. So anything that is protected in the base class or public in base class, base class directly is accessible to the child, to the derived class. Everything that is private in the base class is accessible to the child indirectly through methods, through accessors, okay? So it's not that if the animal has a feature that is private, cat cannot use it. Cat is using it, 
but indirectly through the accessors of uh, uh, a class. What is an accessor? Without looking at your notes? What is an accessor? What is a modifier? It's the exact opposite. Not only private, anything. Changes the state of the class. Okay, changes the, so when we say accessor, it means it's access, so, so something that, so accessor, when you are accessing the thing, that's the query you were talking about. Modifier is the one that uh, accesses the thing and changes it. They're both, they both give you access. One gives you read-only access, the other one gives you read-write access. So when I say accessors, I mean all category of things that we have. We, we, we are dealing with. So we add a number of lives to the, to, the, uh, to the animal. Therefore, the animal that had a name, now it had a name with series of number of lives. Okay? We made we made the setter the setter function, the modifier function, the modifier method, name protected in the animal so descendants of animal can modify the name if they need to. So all children of animal are capable to modify their own name. But because it's protected, outsiders cannot change. As soon as you name an animal, the name sticks. You can't change them unless it's a descendant that wants to change its own name. We good? All right. So whenever your privacy is within family, you have a protected access modifier. Whenever your privacy is within family, you have protected access modifier. Whenever privacy is not in family, everybody can access it, that's public. Whenever privacy is only for the class itself, that's private. So private is class only, protected is family, and public is everyone. Are we good with this? All right. We mentioned that when you create a, when you create a derived class, you can initialize the base class. And we always uh, remember the fact that I, that, that I mentioned right at the moment of creation, when something gets created, so when you have a base class, and then you have a derived class, right out of right at the beginning of the uh, creation of the class, the entire memory for the derived class is instantiated, and within the belly of the derived class, we have a base class, okay? So this is the, 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 the right one. Is it the right? Yeah. Uh, that's your left, right? So, so, the, the <laughs> so the left one is the... Uh, base class, and the right one is the, the, the derived class. So when that happens, <clears throat> remember, so the memory gets created, so the very first thing that happens when the class, is getting, uh, the class is getting instantiated, turning essentially into an object, the very first thing that happens, the memory enough to hold both base and derived class is allocated. It's a contiguous, uh, uh, memory. It's, they're not two different things sitting, an animal and a cat. They are all in the same place. So you can, so you, the animal ends and the cat begins. Let's put it that way. So when the constructor is called, because the base class comes first, the very first thing that wants to happen is the base class to get created, right? And that is, is completely uh, your choice, how to get created, okay? If you don't say anything, the base becomes defaulted. Whatever the default 
constructor of the base class, no argument constructor of the base class is doing, that's going to happen if you don't mention anything. And it doesn't matter how the derived class is getting created, with what type of constructor. You can always choose how to create the base class. You can have a five argument constructor for the derived class, but choose to, to default the base class, or you can have a no argument uh, uh, constructor for the derived class and choose to have the three argument uh, constructor of the base class to, to create the base. It's your choice how to do it. But if you don't mention it, the default constructor of the base class is called. If the base class doesn't have a default constructor and you don't mention it, you gotta get a compilation error. Because compiler says, I don't know how to default the base class. Are we good? All right. And how do we do with all, how do we do the, initial, the, the initialization? We do it exactly how we did with the regular class. So the initialization area over here, that somebody found that name. That, that I said, this is my name, the initialization area. And who did that? You did that? No? I asked the other class, and so probably the guy's not here anymore. <laughs> so the area between closed parentheses and open curly bracket of a constructor, that's the place that you do uh, your uh, initialization. Now, something that is tricky about this initialization that you need to remember is that the initialization must happen in the same order that you have your attributes in the class. So if you, in your attributes you have a float and a double and a character, First, you have to do the, the base constructor because that comes first. Then, what did I say? It was so the float and a double and a, so you have to go with the exact same, not with the type, the name of the variables that you have. So f in this case, because I have the animal in the two argument constructor, first I'm creating the animal using the name that is passed to the two argument constructor of the cat. Then I'm initializing the number of lives with the second argument that is passed through. Okay, and therefore, in a, say, if you do it the other way, probably Visual Studio is not going to tell you anything, but as soon as you get it to Linux and to GNU compiler, it's going to get you over there. Hence the submitted program, okay? So that's that. So as you see, in a default constructor, I chose not to tell how the animal is getting created. Therefore, in line 12, because I didn't mention the default constructor of the animal is gonna get called, but uh, uh, in the other one, I'm actually telling I want the one argument constructor to be called. Are we good? And we said that the most common mistake that people make when they are doing is that they think, and I'm gonna mention it again over here, and I'm gonna mention it again, and again, and again, and that is the most common mistake that people do is this. Rookies, not uh, seasoned programmers, they know. They try to initialize the animal part of the cat like this. And we said if you do something like this, line 18 over here has nothing to do with the current object. At line 18, you are creating a single object of type animal and it dies at line 19. It has nothing to do with the current object. A constructor cannot be called. A constructor's job is to construct. When you call it, it builds an object. It doesn't call anything. So you are saying build an animal at size 18 and kill it. It has nothing to do with the cat. So the animal part of the cat in this case will be defaulted. Okay, so remember, you cannot call a constructor. And one of the things that uh, I see happens that I do not like much is, is doing things like this. Okay? Um, in here, it's not going to work because this is a cat and animal is an animal. So, of course, this, this doesn't work. Don't do this. If you are doing something like this, you are creating lots of overhead. Okay? Lots of people try to reuse other constructors to 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 initialize parts of the current class by having this equals, that is very expensive. As I mentioned, when you do something like this, you are creating a temporary nameless object. So instead of not being lazy and create a simple modifier that sets off your class, you do this, 
And by doing this, first you are creating a temporary nameless object. Then you are assigning the current object to the, all the information of the other one, and then you are killing that object. Why? Because you are lazy to write one method. Don't do that. When you see something like this is happening, simply take the guts of the constructor and put it in a private method and call it set or something. And then call that one instead. So you don't build an object, okay? So don't use that. It's in all books and people do it. It's, uh, it's just too expensive. Whoa, I didn't want to do that. So going back to what we had before, animals should be there to do the proper uh, setting. Are we good down to this point? Any action that you create inside the derived class shadows the, uh, any method that you create with the exact same signature of the method of the parent, overwrite the parent's uh, uh, method, which means the parent's method is not accessible anymore, okay? So, and anything that you do not overwrite, it seamlessly, the parents will be called automatically. <clears throat> so if I create a cat <clears throat> and I say cat, my apologies. <clears throat> Residues of the <clears throat> sickness. Okay, so, so when, you, uh, when you create a cat and you say cat act, the act of the cat will be called because you, over, you uh, overrode it. And if you say cat make a sound, then the sound will be called. If you say cat move, because cat doesn't have a move, automatically the parent is, go is going to get called. And <clears throat> obviously, you can choose to call uh, any parts of the, uh, of the base class manually. <clears throat> to do that, you have to, go, you have to write the name of the base class using the scope resolution, because this sound is it's not animal apostrophe. So remember, <clears throat> An object owns a method. A class designs a method. So for an object, you put dot. For a class, you put scope resolution. Remember that, OK? So if you want to call animals sound in cat, you say animal scope resolution. Make a sound. Obviously, you can add many more features in the derived class that has nothing to do with the base. And those are individual methods that cat has. And maybe the descendants of cats are going to use it. So, or that has nothing to do with them. And uh, the destructor are the same and everything. So, we are okay down to this point? Are we okay? We said this is all good and fine and dandy, but the problem is that when you do something like this, because obviously we are capable of, because we are capable of, uh, let me just try to take this one out. Because we are always capable of calling an object using their family name, because we are always capable of calling an object using their family name, we can, call, we can refer to a cat as an animal. We can always do that. If you do something like that, however, cat will forget being a cat. It goes back to an animal. And none of the features of the cat will be available. So at any moment of time, if you refer to a derived class, and the derived class <coughs> using the base class, now that base could be many levels. You can have, I can have, <coughs> I can have, uh, uh, I can have an animal and a pet and a bird and a bodgy. So now the level of inheritance is four. I have an animal, I have a pet, I have a bird, and I have a bodgy. Okay? If I create a bodgy and refer to it as a bird, it forgets that it's a bodgy. It will be a bird. If I have a, a bodgy and I refer to it as a pet, it forgets that it's the bird or the bodgy. It, re, it becomes a bird. And if I refer to the Bodgy, as an animal, it forgets all the three things and becomes an animal. Okay? That's clear for everyone. And that is the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem is that not all objects 
are created statically. Some objects are created dynamically, which means you create them manually and you need to remove them from memory. If you create an inherited object dynamically, keeping it in a base class's pointer, your handle to delete the object is partial. You don't have an access to the body anymore. You have an animal. And when you delete the animal, the compiler only sees an animal. It forgets that it's a body. Therefore, only the animal part will be deleted, and the pet and a bird and a body will remain in memory, which is your memory leak. And that is one of the most common reasons of memory leak in C++, which we have a remedy for. Are we OK down to this point? Are we OK? Boring stuff, I know, but this is a review. I have to go through it all the way to the end. When you start programming, that becomes nice. Because I see my friend over here is like halfway through coma, right? It's <laughs> well, no, we can't. We can't. Um, anyways, the lack of sleep last night, probably. I don't know. Because he's usually very alert. But today, he forgot his coffee. Anyways, so that's the problem with base classes pointed by, uh, with the derived class pointed by a base class. We fixed that problem. We said, we can always tell to the compiler, hey, check and see if there is a <clears throat> newer version of what we have available and go to that one. And we could select which parts of the class is capable to do so. So we can actually design our very base class to be inherited. Now, I want your attention over here. No, yeah, I want your attention over here. <clears throat> Sometimes you design a class to be a base class, and you know this class is going to, because of the business logic that you have, like you create, let's say we are in a bank, and I create a class called account. I am 100% sure that this is going to get inherited into mutual funds, into, uh, I don't know, checking account, into saving account, into US dollar account. So this is going to get inherited. And so I know 100% that this is going to get inherited. OK? If that's the case, then you start applying the magical word virtual to the functions, to the methods of the class that you think need to get upgraded. But for example, if you have an account and you have a balance for it, the balance of an account is for everything is a balance. You don't need to upgrade that. If that's the case, you say balance is not virtual. Uh, what is that? Um, my mind went black. How, there, how your account gains money after, while, uh, as it goes through? Interest. So, so but, but, but gaining interest would be different between saving and checking accounts. So that should be virtual. Right? So, <clears throat> so depending on what your business logic is, you make certain things virtual and certain things non-virtual to make sure that the latest version of all card, if you rem remember. But there is one thing and one thing only <clears throat> that no matter what type of you class you create, if it's designed to be a base class or not, you must always have it and you must always make it virtual to guarantee in future you're not going to have a memory leak. So when you create a class, no matter what type of a class you have, and this is extremely important, I want you to wake up right now and listen to me. <clears throat> when you create a class, first of all, you must have a destructor for your class, no matter if you want it or not. So if you don't want it, if you, if you just want to create a destructor and you don't want it, you just write the prototype and you say default. It means I don't want to implement it just create an empty destructor for me. That's equal to default, OK? Either you do that, <clears throat> or if you want to do something in it, then you do something in it. But in this case, <clears throat> we, we had something in it. Anyways, the second thing is that you have to make that destructor virtual. So having something like this guarantees that no, no matter what type of a handle you have to a class, if it's a base handle, half. Like if it's a parent handle or it's a regular, it doesn't matter what. 
no matter how you remove this object from memory, always the latest constructor, destructor, will be called. And therefore, the entire thing is out of memory. Is that clear for everyone? So remember that. No matter how we create a class, you must have a destructor. If you don't want a destructor, it's a defaulted destructor. And that destructor must be virtual. That's the rule for it. Are we OK with this? So go back to all the things you have done before. And if you have <clears throat> any classes that it didn't have a destructor, add one to it now. Because in a final milestone, I'll mark those things. Yes? Wait, 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 wait. <clears throat> mentioned about the virtual stuff mm -hmm. I mean always looking for the latest then why the compilers not making this as the default I mean to look for the latest things for everything oh yeah sure I'll, I'll let you know what <coughs> because sometimes you want classes to behave as what they are at all times you don't want them to be modifiable even if it's inherited See, like, let's say I want to create a class. I don't mind if they inherit my class. But I want, if this class is referred, I want an animal to be wild all times. If that's the case, I'm not going to make anything virtual. Which means if you refer to a pet as an animal, it's going to bite you. But as soon as it becomes pet, now the behavior changes and becomes kind and tame and playful. It, that's, so you have to have this choice. Otherwise, the lion that is tame and the lion that is wild become the same thing. You, it's a matter of life and death, right? So that's what I'm saying. So, so it's, it's, it's something. And there is one important rule in C++. Now, I'll, I'll explain so you'll see. I'll answer your question. In, I'm going to give you an example from Java, OK? Um, you take the choice away, you make the language more secure, but you lose power. It's like you're allowed to carry a gun, so you're a powerful person now, right? So if we, I'm not, I'm actually completely against having guns, by the way. I'm just, oh my God. Like I'm one of those people who say like it has to be banned, we don't need guns. But let's say, let's say you, if you have a gun and you know how to use it, it's good for you, it's power. But if you don't know, you shoot yourself in a foot, right? So that's the exact, that's C++. It gives you power. But with power comes responsibility, they say, right? So if you have a language like this, you have power. It's unsafe, but it has lots of power. You take that choice away. You take the power away. You make it safe and secure. So that's what C++. In C++, you can do anything you want, almost. 99%. You can, you can literally, in any part of your C++, you can write ASM, open the curly bracket, and you can start writing assembly code. Like literally talk to CPU and do stuff with it. So it's a very powerful thing. But anyways, so that was the answer. Why not do it? Because you, want, you always want to have the choice. So virtuality guarantees that the latest version of the of the method is called. And therefore, in this animal of mine, when the cat creates the action and the sound, no matter how I refer to the cat, always the action of the cat is called. And always it's going to sound like a cat. But how it's going to move, it depends how, I, how do I refer to it. If I refer to cat as a cat, it's going to move like a cat. But if I refer to a cat as, a, as an animal, it's going to move like an animal because I made it an animal. I'm going to change this. That tame thingy was a nice thing. Or, or in act, I can add act in a tame. I'll, I'll do it later for the, for the next class, <laughs> for next OP244 class, so next semester. But yeah, so that's what it is. So, so <clears throat> the virtuality over here does that. So no matter what happens in this, uh, in this thing, virtual does that. So that's what we learn and what we know. We are OK with virtuality. We know what's going on. And remember, <clears throat> virtuality only works with functions that you override. It must have identical signature. You cannot overload a function. If I have a sound inside the cat that has a 
pro, uh, uh, an argument called volume. <laughs> okay, how loud is the sound going to be? Then that's not virtuality. That's overloading. It has nothing. It's, it's just two different types of the thing, right? So to, to make something virtual, you must have identical functions. Are we good? Yes. Too late. Okay. <laughs> okay. Virtual is transitive. You know what is the meaning of transitive? It leaks. So if you make the animal action virtual, you don't need to mention virtual for anything after. Everything automatically is virtual. So if you if you uh, if you have a uh, a bird, and you have a falcon, and you have a bhaji, and the fly is virtual. Animals don't fly. Shoot, that's a bad. Oh, move. The move is virtual in the animal, but nowhere else. If you tell to bird to move, the falcon's going to fly like a falcon, and the bhaji's going to fly like a. Oh. Only the first. It's transitive. It it leaks to to uh, yeah. So we got to this point and everything was so everything is good down to this point, right? Okay. Then we talked about the next thing that at that I kind of started it. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about that now and um, uh, we'll be done with it in in a, in a, in a second. So um, we said that sometimes actions taken by a base class are definite but not certain. Sometimes actions taken by a base class is definite but not certain. It means definitely the base class should be able to take that action, but you're not certain how. Okay? So, <clears throat> and we, we gave the example for talking, if you remember. And I said, I talk in certain language and people talk in different, different languages. And I am 100% certain that uh, human beings can talk, but I don't know how. So it's definitely, it's definite that human beings can talk, but I'm not certain how. That's why the action of talk should be added to a human being, but in a way, just to make sure that it's going to be added in future for sure because a human being can talk, but I cannot tell you how yet. When you have a class that there are many actions that are known now and you can do it, and some of the actions remains uncertain, and it has to be set in future derivatives, in future descendants of this class, then you make that function pure virtual. A pure virtual function is a function, a pure, I keep saying function, I'm a bad person saying so, because it's not, it's not pure virtual function, it's pure virtual method or pure virtual member function. There is no virtual function. A standalone function is just a crappy C function. It has nothing, it doesn't have any owner, so, so nothing applies to it. Oops. So <clears throat> now, in here, <clears throat> I'm making this sound pure virtual, which means I don't know how an animal is going to make a sound. I have no idea how it's going to do that. And there's something that I didn't mention in the other one. I have to mention it now. Um, actually, maybe, maybe I can mention it in the last step. But anyways, so. When I create a pure virtual method, I am just writing the prototype. So that's the syntax. I'm just writing the prototype of the method that it's on line 13 now that I'm saying an animal can make a sound. Equals zero means I don't know how yet. Which means anybody creating an animal class in future, which means the descendant of the animal, for that class to be able to exist 
as an object, it must implement the sound, otherwise it can't, like an animal. An animal cannot exist because it is incomplete, doesn't have an action fully implemented. It's an incomplete class. Because it's an incomplete class, it's only an idea. It's an abstraction of what you want to do. It's not a complete thing. Because it's abstraction, we call it an abstract-based class. An abstract-based class is a class in C++ that holds at least one pure virtual method. And for any descendant not to be abstract, they need to implement the sound. If I inherit something out of an animal and I don't implement the sound, that's not a syntax error. That's just another abstract based class, which means it, the class can exist, but it cannot get instantiated. Okay? But the actions of an abstract based class is identical to uh, a regular um, virtual function. So in here, when I actually when I actually ask for a, if I ask for an animal to make a sound, I am literally calling the animals, as you see the pointer in line 13 over here is of type animal. And I'm saying animal, make a sound. But animal doesn't have a function implemented. It has a, it's a pure virtual function. So I'm literally telling to the compiler, go find out who's the descendant. And it's going to choose if it's a cat, it's going to say meow. If it's a dog, it's going to say woof, woof. Okay? And that's how pure virtual functions enforce design. How pure virtual functions enforce design. Now, I'm a person. And I want to force all my programmers to design a class that does certain things. And I don't want to write any code for it. What do I do? I create a class that has only pure virtual functions in it and nothing else. So I'm saying any class that you create must have these specifications if it's supposed to be of this type. Like, for example, I would say I create a, a an, uh, an abstract based class, let's call it window, okay? And for window, I, on a window on a, on, in an application. And uh, for window, I'm gonna put series of abstract based, uh, uh, pure virtual functions. Open, close, uh, display, move, all the things that a window on a desktop can do, okay? I'm not gonna implement any of them. And then I'm gonna, I say, okay, now you guys can create window that you want, but this is the minimum thing that a window requires. I'm sure that that window of mine has a, default, a, a, a constructor that is defaulted, and it's virtual, definitely, but the other things. Now, if you want to create a dialog box, you've got to say dialog box is a window that opens like this, moves like this, gets edited like this. So all the pure virtuals of the window should get created for your dialog box to exist. That this is the absolute polymorphism. The, all the poly, that's the next thing I wanted to mention, actually. All the polymorphisms that you learned down to this point, they were fake. We talked about casting, coercion, to be polymorphism, polymorphic thing. You can say, uh, you could do in C, right? A is equal to B plus C. B could be an integer, and C could be a double. The plus over here is polymorph, right? because you can add two integers, add, but it wasn't polymorph, it was just casting, right? Or, or operator overloading. We said you can create two functions, sorry, function overloading. You could say, I can create the functions with the same name and different number of arguments, and we call that polymorphic. But when you look at it closely, you will see that the compiler is actually attaching the types of the arguments to the name. So the add that you had for two floats was add float float. The add that you had for integers was add int int. So the names are different. It's not polymorphic, really. OK? So those are fake polymorphism. <clears throat> so this one is not fake. This is real. Because the function that you are calling, the method that you are calling, is identical between all of them. There is no <clears throat> signature difference. Nothing. It, auto, it just magically chooses the best option for you, the latest option for you as the as the uh, execution progresses. Are we okay with this? 
Yes. You can't. You can't have an animal object. The compiler is going to give you an error. Because your animal is incomplete, you cannot create it. Okay? So, an app, so, so going back to what I was saying, if I try to create an animal, it's going to tell me object of abstract class type yada yada is not allowed. You can't. The, the, the definition of an abstract base class is to have at least one pure virtual method. Okay? So you can have a base class, but to be, for it to be abstract, you need at least one pure virtual function. And we said that if your class contains everything, that, if your class, everything that your class contains is Oh, shoot. Actually, it's good. Compile it, and you get an error. You know that you have to remove the, 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 the main. I'm going to leave it over there with an error. So when you compile, you see the animal cannot get created. Um, so now, as you see over here, I have an animal. And my animal is an interface. That's why it's called interface. An interface is just an interface to other classes. It's of no use by itself. It doesn't know how to do anything. It just wants to do stuff. It's a wannabe thing. <laughs> it can't do anything. OK? And that's why you call an interface. All right? Now, the interesting part is that uh, Java, for example, I was mentioning you were talking about control. Java doesn't have a pure virtual method. You cannot have something like that. Java has only interface. So you literally have a keyword card interface. You can create an interface, so you can either have an interface or you have a solid of uh, a, what we call it. Uh, uh, we have abstract classes and we have concrete classes. Concrete classes are classes that have everything implemented. Abstract classes are classes that have at least one pure virtual method. Now, what I was saying was, what I was saying, that Java doesn't let you have pure virtual functions in your class. So it gives you only, you're only allowed to have an interface. So interface in C++ doesn't exist. We don't have anything. We just know that if we have everything as pure virtual, in object-oriented methodology, we call it an interface. It's like strings in C. There is no such thing as string in C. It's just following a standard to put a null at the end of something. They say, a C string. C string doesn't exist. It just tells you, hey, when you finish, put a null at the end. That's what the meaning of the thing. It's the same thing in here. An interface doesn't exist in C++. It's just, it's referred to a class that has only pure virtual methods in it. Yes? But if you cannot have a pure... An object must know how to get destroyed. <laughs> you cannot have a pure virtual one. Oh, yeah. So, so you say, uh, because, anim because the destructor is not pure virtual, this is not an interface. <laughs> no. Because the destructor is not a function, it doesn't count. OK. <laughs> OK, we said that destructor and constructors are not functions. Remember, I was leaving, are not functions. These are not functions. These are, yeah. So. Now, let's go to a, a broader example over here to see how, how things can be actually said. Um, so now, let's take a look at what we have in here. This is our animal kingdom, OK? I have an animal. Out of an animal, I have a pet. Out of a pet, I have a cat, goldfish, and a bird. Out of a bird, I have a budgie. So that's the hierarchy of things that I have. Now, let's take a look at this and see what's abstract over here and what's not. OK? So first of all, my animal over here is, is see how I, what I did over here? That's old C++ when we didn't have equal to default. 
So I'll fix that. In old C++, you couldn't have equal to default. So now I'm going to have equal to default. Not to put that curly bracket, empty curly bracket thingy anymore. So that's my uh, interface now. OK? And then I have a pet. Now, let's take a look at the pet. Pet has a name. It can move and make a sound, right? What, what was an animal? What are the methods of the pet? Sound, move, name, and name, right? Over here is act, move, and sound, right? Where is the act in pet? So pet is still abstract. You cannot instantiate pet. Pet cannot exist on its own. It has to get instantiated to something else. So remember, a class that does not implement the pure virtual method of its parent remains abstract. It cannot be instantiated. We good? And another thing that you can do at any level of inheritance that you find fit, you can actually overload whatever you want for your base class, and automatically everything in the derived one will be used. So if I do the extraction insertion operator for a pet, everything after a pet know how to uh, uh, insert themselves into a into a into into O Street. So when I have a pet, and I can, and I could actually have this one in there. So in here, I put it in a pet. So if you look at the pet over here, we have actually a pet CPP in here. Pet CPP, pet CPP, pet CPP. And in pet CPP, I have many things, and I have the operator overload, right? I'll remove that. So no operator overload over here. And instead, I'm going to create an animal CPP. Because animal was an interface, it doesn't have a source code, right? There is no CPP file. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I was very observative. I wish you were my student. I would add 1%. But, <laughs> but anyway, so, so, <clears throat> so I'm going to go to source files, and I'm going to create an animal.cpp. So I'm going to say add new item, and the new item over here is going to be it's for some reason I put lowercase. Huh. Okay. So in here I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna put animal.cpp. And in this animal, I'm gonna include my animal, obviously. And instead, I'm gonna have this created for an animal. Okay? And obviously, I'm going to need IO stream in here and using namespace std. OK. Now, why is it giving me an error on animal? Oh, thank you. And in here, I'm going to say, make a sound. OK? Oh, no, 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 no. Not OSDR, make a sound. Just make a sound. Yeah. What is that huge? <laughs> Doesn't let me click. Yeah, I'm think. OK, <clears throat> and I'm going to put this one over here. And obviously, because I have this one, I'm going to have over here something like, and this is going to be there, all ST, so good. So now, as you see, although I have an interface, I can overload things to work with my interface. And because of doing something like this, everything else that is an animal now know how to insert themselves to any type of O stream object by default. I can always change it. I can 
create another overload in a body and create an O stream OSDR with a constant body reference, obviously that overloads it so I can, ov I can overload this to change it later on. But if I don't do it, it still know how to show itself on a screen or, or insert stuff into an O stream or any type of O stream. So this is an extremely vast thing. You can put it in a file because O stream is uh, the parent of the database classes of, of OF stream, right? So you can actually put it in a file if you want to. So it works for a file, it works for a pet, it works for a cat, it works for a dog, it works for a fish, it works for a bird. It works for all of them. By only doing one thing in the interface, I applied the logic to all its descendants. Nothing is more satisfying than that, that you can implement a logic that covers vast objects to use it without putting an effort to do on every single one of them. That is absolutely impossible in structured programming. And that's why, like this, you can actually organize your thought. You think about it over here, you set the logic, and you forget about it. And everything else just simply works. And I'm telling you, seriously, and I mention it every single time, when I reach to this point, I get goosebumps, because it's a beautiful feature of object orientation. OK, this polymorphism is crazy. It works really nicely. And then the rest of the examples that I put over here is just uh, showing with all overloading stuff. So let me just uh, close all tabs over here. So this one is actually, uh, what is it doing in here? Same thing. It's with uh, uh, overloading, and this one has constructor and destructor messages. So please play with them. Go at home, modify the code, break it, try to add features to it, and, and learn it, and come back with any questions you want. So we are officially up to date. This is the thing that we were supposed to have this, this week. We have nothing else to go through. Any questions? Uh, I was actually ha very happy. Uh, I th seriously, I mean, uh, a very important question. What is the sequence of destructors to happen? Okay, it's always reverse order. So <clears throat> imagine a stack of plates that you put in a kitchen. You put the first, second, third, fourth, and you come, you put 10 dishes over there, right? When you remove it, which one you move? The last one goes out first. That's always the case. Because it comes from the base to the top, it comes from top to the base. That structure in computer program is called a stack. You're going to learn it in data structure and design. And with a stack, you can push and pull stuff in it. And that's how the compiler does it. All your function calls are done like that. That's how the compiler knows how to go back to the last function that was called. And the structures happen like that. It always go to re reverse. <clears throat> Other questions? Any question one? Any question two? Sold. Done. Have yourself a beautiful day. See you next